Welcome. It's just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday the 5th of May. You are watching Regional Rat. It's our fifth episode. Regional Rat, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates and joining me on this episode are my guests, Jane Condon and Colin Donegan. Jane is the Managing Director and Founder of Project Mind Boomerang. He is a Brisbane-based businessman, but we won't hold that against him. <laughs> he has worked in the meat and seafood, seafood industries as both business operator and a consultant. His, his work has involved developing export markets in Japan, Southeast Asia, the US, South Americas, as well as pioneering, he pioneered the first of sort of Australia's uh, prawn farms in the Northern Territory as part of a private uh, project. Jane has recruited a strong team of highly capable and world-class professionals and and companies to, committed to delivering the Iron Boom project, goal, business goals and objectives. Joining with Jane is Colin. He is a senior strategic and technical advisor to a range of mining companies and international management consultancy. He has 38 years experience in the mining, mining industry. He has worked, at, worked or visited over 300 mine sites worldwide. He provides he provides a unique combination of exceptional ac academic achievement with a deep level of practical experience across a broad range of mining activities, commodities and geographies, across large scale projects and existing operations. Deliverables include legal and environmental management for greenfield and brownfield operating sites. The breadth of the Collins experience covers commodities on coal, through to gold, iron ore, and other metals, as well, as well as quarry operations. Collins' geographical exposure has been across all states of Australia, 14 provinces and municipalities of China, also Indonesia, Russia, the Ukraine, Africa, US, Korea, Thailand, Japan, and India. Well, that's a pretty tiring episode, Colin. So, Shane and Colin, welcome. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the invitation to talk to uh, North Queensland and uh, and the rest of your uh, associates and uh, people. Well, North Queensland and Northern West Australia and Northern Australia in general will be the main beneficiaries of of your Iron Boomerang project. So we're looking forward to getting a leg up and starting off uh, both on employment matters and also the, the benefits that will deliver to the nation. Uh, if I could start, just start off the show with um, sharing a screen of the overview of the project and then we'll, we'll talk, talk to the project. The audience can see there the uh, map for of a, Northern Australia. Um, basically, all, all the area in that northern sector there is comes under the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility funding, uh, so it belongs to that area. And it's very interesting in regards to the connection of the railway line to across Australia. Um, and, the, and can you tell us a little bit about that planning and the endpoints of that railway line, because. Uh, it's, well, uh, it's obviously the critical link, and from, from our recent experience about two years ago when we had big rainfalls, our mine a bit north, north of that from Mount Isa um, got washed away. So I hope the uh, project sort of scoping and uh, development sort of looked into all those foreseeable calamities we experience up in the northern Australia? Yeah, well, the target on that map um, is um, the world's biggest seaborne coking coal fields, linking to the world's biggest iron ore seaborne uh, bulk uh, fields and connecting to the ports in Queensland and WA. 
Uh, there'll be steel complexes and in, in uh, at Newman um, within 50k of the, of uh, the four big Pilbara mines, 50 to 80k uh, radius, and uh, connecting to the coal, coking coal fields at Moomba or Collinsville, uh, which um, again in coking coal terms, uh, the world's premium coking coal fields. Uh, Australia dominates uh, the world in about 65-70% in iron ore supplies, seaborne, and uh, it's even greater for coking coal and a very scarce material worldwide. Colin could comment on that with his credentials. But um, uh, the steel complexes will be at the Abbott Point State Development Zone near Bowen and it's already gazetted and it's rare in the OECD, 36 uh, countries to have such a industrial site suitable already. And likewise at Newman, there's tons of, we've done the survey. The rail survey has been done. Um, you mentioned about the flood zones and the Gal Galilee floodplain. Um, we will be building the rail for a hundred to 200 year flood mitigation. Our corridor already preliminary surveyed would have avoided the 100 year floods that you recently had a couple of years ago. Uh, I found that very interesting. And we had a lot of the flood zone maps. Some of the big coal mine ridge rails, the four rails that were proposed, we were one of them. Um, uh, over the Galilee Basin would be un would have been underwater during those floods a couple of years ago. So um, if they want to build a 200 year flood mitigation, it'll cost an extra billion or two over the 16 billion. So the steel makers, when they form the five steel mills at each end, they'll sit as a board and they'll make that decision to spend that extra money. So uh, I think I've explained the, your question, Bill. Uh, Colin may have a comment. Just on one thing in regards to the track, you know, one of the one of the big sticking points with uh, Australia becoming a nation was as colonies, depending on how wealthy they were, decided what what gauge railway they were. Now, uh, New South Wales, because at the colonial times it was the Premier, premier state still considered itself the premier state mm. and it went with a, a large gauge i think it's five, five foot something five foot eight and a half. Half. Mm. yeah which it was, is is victoria couldn't match it but it still it can, still came up with a reasonable size one and then i think west australia only had three three six um three foot six Please, and, please and, and so we had that disconnect right across australia now I, I remember uh, when Twiggy Forest was getting Fortescue up and trying to get access to the railways lines in West Australia that already existed. This is a matter of interest. The gauges in West Australia in, in the iron, iron ore fields, are they all standard and will that be your yeah. standard? Well, the, rail, different? the rail will be built, um, BHP Monash Rail Research, now called Monash Rail, is the leading heavy haul rail opponents and designed the Pilbara rail systems, which are the world's most efficient heavy haul rail system by far in the world. They've been upgraded for their axle loads. They're five foot eight and a half. Four and, foot, four foot eight and a half. Yeah, five foot eight and a half standard gauge. No, four foot eight and a half. Four, four, yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, four foot eight and a half, yeah. Um, the um, yeah, yeah, we need to check that. Um, the um, uh, the heavy haul line is quite a different line to an ordinary rail. So that all connects up to the Darwin to Adelaide line and to Perth, of course. That's all standard gauge across to Melbourne at Sydney and to the back of Brisbane, yeah. um, all on the same gauge. So when the standard gauge comes into Bowen, it will be 200 miles, uh, 44 tonne axle, which is the highest standard in the world. 
we'd be able to put the all the tanks from Townsville and the biggest army defense center in Australia and and the fuel tankers and everything on one train. One train will hold 44,000 gross ton iron ore train and it'll travel at an average speed of 85k and cross the 3,300k from Newman uh, to Bowen, uh, Abbott Point uh, in about uh, 36 hours. Dump and reload's about 56 hours. So uh, uh, it will connect, but on a lower gauge, uh, axle load, not a lower gauge, a lower axle load of 26 tonne and 22 tonne on the Darwin to Adelaide line. It was unfortunately built at a very low axle rating. So uh, we would need more, our trains couldn't run on the Darwin line full, but of course they can run run passenger lines, good trains and, 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 and wagons with more axles on them. So Colin may have some comments, yeah. Yeah, look, the, the Australia's moved progressively towards standard gauge. Um, the, there's a missing link uh, going into Brisbane, which is why um, Shane said into the back of Brisbane. Um, but uh, everything we're constructing is standard gauge at uh, same gauge as uh, what's used in the Pilbara, what's used in Adelaide to Darwin, what's used in all of New South Wales, and also what's used in the Indian Pacific. So it, um, it uh, means that uh, you've got uh, full connectivity. The special part about uh, Project Iron Boomerang is, as Shane said, we've got 44 tonne axle loads, which are used in some parts of the Pilbara. Uh, and that allows us to, um, to use uh, very, very heavy haul um, wagons. And the, the secret to, or it's not so much a secret, we're not uh, hiding it, but the big advantage of uh, Project Iron Boomerang is that we can back haul. So the iron ore goes from the west to the east and the coking coal loads into exactly the same train and goes from the east to the west. And that reduces your haulage costs significantly. And so, it's, so it's, it's billions, a major, it's major billions annually, yeah, savings. Mm. And not only that, it allows you to export east and west across the Pacific and across the Indian Ocean straight away. It, exactly. And, and look, Bill, I might jump to... Um, uh, what is normally the next question is why rail and not shipping? Because um, when I've talked to people about Project Iron Boomerang, a lot of them say, well, why don't you ship the ore around Australia? But the, the fact is that the, um, the ports that we've got are all outloading ports and, and they're, they're already cramped for room. And if you're going to have inloading ports, you've got to have twice as much stockpile room. And, and unloading a ship because they're grabs rather than um, conveyors at high capacity going in. It's much slower to unload a ship. Um, and you three need times. Um, three yeah, times yeah three times as long. And you need more room. Plus, um, using the rail is, is, is cheaper. The cost of building the uh, inloading ports is probably more expensive than building the rail. Uh, three times dearer for the world. Yeah. And, and, and then they're billions also, extra. Yeah, we're also reducing the uh, shipping um, that would be going through the Great Barrier Reef. So there's environmental advantages as well. Uh, and, and, and another advantage too is, as Shane said, 56 hours turnaround means you've got fresh coal delivered. Oh, it's two to three weeks by ship. Yes. One way. So it's much shorter by rail. And a lot of people don't realise, but coking coal loses its properties progressively as it gets... Um, a little bit older, it's best used fresh, you get a better result out of it. So there's significant um, uh, metallurgical benefits of the rail compared to the shipping, not only... Well, uh, in, in logistics supply chain annually, it's it, to make 44 million tonne of steel, it's mm. billions extra in cost. Yes, yeah. But the, it gives us an advantage within Australia compared to shipping, but a huge advantage to the current consumers of our coking coal overseas because it's typically 20 days haul uh, or, or sea freight. Uh, so the, uh, the coal's used much more freshly if it's used in Australia. Just on that, um, so I mentioned sort of Twiggy Forrest and his uh, battle with the existing uh, uh, lines or 
uh, infrastructure in the Pilbara before he got there. Um, are, you, are you likely to be um, good social community type people in regards to um, if there's development along your line? Because my, the railway line has a possibility in regards to people might just go out there and look around and find other different metals and ores and things like that. Um, you got the sort of the com oh. com com oh. long term oh. commitment in regards to if someone comes up with, they f suddenly find some copper mine somewhere near your line and want to put a spur onto your line, yep. are you going to make it make life for them easy or difficult? Oh no, it, it'll it'll ten times their production because they'll have a heavy haul line. The sulphate of potash in Lake Mackay and Lake Disappointment on the WANT border, that is worth 550 bucks US a ton. Hmm. Iron ore is now about 170, Colin, 180. Oh, it's gone up 180 plus now. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's very high. But uh, sulphate of potash, they're driving a, a truck from Lake, Lake Mackay, I think it is, and I can send you the photographs up to Wyndham, 970k, and coming That's back. A lot to of diesel. Fuel. That's a lot of diesel fuel. That is the best fertilizer mine and farm for Australia in the world. So Australia will become, with the Iron Boomerang line, will become heavy haul, the best, most efficient heavy haul line in the world. Mm. Not Russia, Canada, USA. It's the number one. Mm. And, so basically, and, what we what we're saying is, boom, be on the, and the railway line, it's not yep. just there for your potential, but it's there for us, the national potential of other. Oh, people. Well, there'll be so, fifty new mines. There'll be copper, silver, lead, zinc, gold, uh, uranium mines, five billion dollar mines. We know of two of that will develop. They'll be able to build the mines, and Colin's an expert in this because we'll be able to take in modules mm. 30 foot high, 30 foot wide on a flat top wagon that can take uh, can take a thousand ton on one wagon, mm. you know, with multiple, multiple uh, axles. Mm. So um, that will cut the cost of building the mine in half. And also it, the time. It can save time. So it'll be modular constructed, you know, the whole thing will be pre... No, and, and, and it'll make it so efficient. So a lot of mines that would never develop or couldn't afford to develop will develop on iron boomerang. Mm. So, I mean, that will be worth, could be worth a trillion to Australia as, mm. a, as okay. a balance sheet asset, national mm. assets and exports. Mm. So the world needs so a, you're a, good corporate to citizen. Be a mine and a farm. <laughs> We've been a mine and a farm for 100, 150 years and, and will be for the next. And if we can value add it, and which we'll do with Iron Boomerang as well, it, it'll support the industrialization. Colin can go on about building mines. He's built them in Russia and all over the world. So, but he, he couldn't believe how efficient we, mm -hmm. we can, the ship that's behind me can load a 30 foot high, 30 foot wide foot or a, a, a modular and roll straight onto the wagon straight across the continent anywhere. Mm. And also a fully assembled 300 ton truck, not a disassembled one. Mm. And, the, and, and the police escorts cost more than the original purchase of the truck often, all that stuff, you know, to get it to the mine. Mm. But Colin can tell you some amazing <laughs> stories on that, but we haven't got time. So. <laughs> Look, Bill, let me just say that there's a lot of what we call stranded assets in the middle of Australia for which there's no current logistical solution. Uh, Project Iron Boomerang is, uh, it'll be as much as um, uh, a steel making project, it'll be a community asset because the capacity of the line is huge. It's absolutely huge. And we can add to that capacity, which will reduce our unit costs for the steel making as well as being able to share the um, use of that infrastructure with others for their benefit. So, so on, on, on Boomerang, you should also have a big sticker, good corporate citizen. Yes, very much so. <laughs> well, it's more Cause, than- Because that is critical. It's more than nation building in Australia. It's the whole of South Asia, India, Vietnam, 
Bangladesh, 200 million people, 270 million in Indonesia. They all need this cement and steel, which I'm boomerang will be producing. And the fertilizer that I just yes, spoke yes. of. Fertilizer. The uranium and everything else that'd be copper, silver, lead and zinc. So it'll all happen. If we just come back to Queensland and our coal field, um, I think our coal fields are fairly notorious for small gauge rail um, around the place. Uh, do you see any problems in because the way, the way the uh, railway lines come constructed, it comes tends to come into coal fields, then go up to Bowen. Uh, is there any issues with uh, existing lines? There is uh, no, says, no. Well, uh, that we've gone into that very carefully with QR rail engineers. Uh, QR being the biggest narrow gauge coal system in the world. And it's very, in the old days, 40 years ago, and it's had its day really in efficiency, but um, in the old days, it was the number one in the world in efficiency. It, went, it was really did a good job and has done a great job. But we, they will cut the coking coal to Abbott Point. We're not gonna dump it at Moomba or Collinsville and, and down to Abbott Point, but we, they will dump it at Moomba or Collinsville and uh, we're not sure which, which town it'll be. And so 22 million tonne will go to West Australia uh, after the iron ore is run train. The same train carries coking coal and iron ore. Coking coal with limestone is almost a perfect load each way. Mm -hmm. Okay, 32 million tonne each way. A total capacity on the line is 64 million tonne, but because it's payload each way, only the, the, the 44 tonne axle line has a capacity for 140 million tonne with passing loops. So uh, that line costs 16 billion, but it's open space, it's a billiard table. It's the best continent on earth to build a railway line. It's at half the cost of just about anywhere else on, on earth. Yeah. Bill, it's no um, ideal. Bill, can I just talk a little bit about the design that's gone into this railway line? There's a, uh, the world's leading survey company is Quantum Trimble. They, um, the Trimble theodolites are well known in industry. And uh, they used a desktop system with satellite imagery combined with um, uh, information from um, uh, basically the state government databases uh, of, um, of uh, land geography, uh, geological features, and they did a, an optimization program to design the line so that it, it's got a one in 300 grade, which is Shane said, that's a billiard table. There's nothing um, on earth. Nothing, nowhere really else that. has that. Um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, line design avoids uh, cultural areas, but goes close enough to communities that we can support the regional and remote communities without impacting on them uh, negatively. So we bring a whole heap of uh, societal benefits to uh, particularly all those Aboriginal communities across the top. We're avoiding all of the known sites that are of importance to them. Um, same with even um, uh, European uh, heritage and that sort of stuff. We're optimizing the location with respect to uh, expected foundation conditions from the known geology and uh, optimising grade. There's been a lot of work going to designing the, uh, the route of the, the railway line. Um, we still have to do on-site uh, foundation testing, and that might mean that there's little adjustments here and there, but they're likely to be minor given the um, high standard and the uh, amount of work that's been done so far. Being, being uh, interested in North Queensland and we're, we're we're looking forward, hopefully, to the, uh, well, the Carmichael mine's the first one that's cab out of the rank on the Galilee, but we're looking for, forward, hopefully, um, to the Galilee being completely opened up. And there's, I think there's about seven proposed mines on there. Mm. I expect they'd all have to have uh, their uh, lines, railway lines in as well. Mm. Uh, I presume, sort of all but been taken into account the 
the existing uh, deposits and and uh, and uh, mine to, locations. Yeah. So, so the minimise impact. It's, yeah. up to, it's up to elected governments to approve or disprove mines or anything else. Mm. Uh, we can, we'd have no say in that. Mm. But uh, if they wish to do do that efficiently, they just need to copy what they did in the Bowen Basin. One line can service the whole lot, mm. not four lines as when we were one of those as proposed. But once we build our east west. We can connect one spur line to pick up the whole of the, the mm. whole of the Galilee if the government so so wishes. Whatever government, so mm. it's up to governments to approve or disprove mines. We're not involved in any of that. But if they want it carted effectively, it'll be the most efficient mm. whole line on earth for mm. that. I, th th I think with the Bowen Basin, we we're fortunate. We had a government that was back in the days of Joe when things just got done and <laughs> and, and That's right. <laughs> and, and there was quite nothing the else got in the way of, way of it. Proposing four lines, which and, and tens of millions were spent on those surveys to one destination, was a world record in coal history, and that was done by one of the governments. Four <laughs> lines to one destination. That's a world record in rail history in the world. <laughs> um, and only Queensland could do that. Um, yeah. I'm sorry to be critical, but it sh you should be critical on that. When one line, as they did in the Bowen Basin, served the whole lot. Mm. And uh, I mean, they have four different companies proposed for running through very high quality farms on black soil floodplains. I saw the debris in the trees above some of the, the, the line surveys. I flew with Vaughan Johnson in a helicopter with one of the farmers. And the debris was 15 foot in the tree above the, the corridor rail, the, the top of the rail. That was a coal line. Mm. So got, and and the, we had one of the biggest floods and Vaughan and I were in the same plane, mm. old Vaughan, he's well known in that, in that district. Mm. Long, second longest serving member in the Queensland parliament. So, I mean, we just couldn't, shaking our heads. And this property was on, next to a river, black soil, and exported 22 million bucks worth of produce a year. And they're running the line straight through the middle of it, mm -hmm. totally disrupting it. Mm. And it never went ahead anyway, because it was all so badly planned by the government at the time. I'm not out, I'm not into government bashing, but boy, that was the worst case in the world of bad yeah, planning. The stress we're, puts we're, on we're land I'll, I'll just say, Bill, that we're applying what we believe is a much higher standard of planning to um, uh, to what we propose to do. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get fuel to the farmers at half the price mm -hmm. that they're paying now, a thousand K inland. Mm -hmm. I mean, Iron Boomerang, the benefit to the Aboriginal communities, remote tourism. There's, I think there's 600,000 people a day in the world moving to cities. Mm -hmm. And remote tourism will be huge. So mm -hmm. Tim Fisher and I, who's passed away, we used to talk about running again east to west from Port Edland to Bowen. And uh, I think it'll be huge. There were already ships before the pandemic. 4,000 people on cruise ships watching iron ore load in the Pilbara. How boring is that? <laughs> God, uh, fun. I don't, I don't you know. know. If, you if you haven't seen it before, uh, if so you haven't jump seen on again, they'll jump on again, come over to Bowen and Cairns and Mackay, come over there and catch a red emperor on the Barrier Reef. How good's that? <laughs> well, well, I've got to admit, I must be a pretty sort of boring person because when I went up to Weeper, I spent at least half an hour just watching the low loaders mm. work on these mountains of, of bauxite mm. and stockpiling them. And I to get them ready to the conveyor belts because uh, the storage area is on one side of the highway and the conveyor belt goes across across the highway out to the port and loads the ships. Mm. Now I've I could never get over this guy in a low you know in a big front end loader going up and maybe it wasn't 45 degrees but gee whiz it was pretty steep and and it sort of 
it is sort of mesmerizing in regards to how does he do that in regards to isn't he afraid of coming you know, coming a cropper because it looks awfully dangerous to me because oxide isn't the most stable material hmm. well uh, there are some very very high skilled operators in those in tough conditions hmm. some of the toughest in the world colin knows more about it but i know a bit about it because i've been so associated with them most of my life mm. in different ways in the rural areas. But uh, Colin's the expert there. Mm. Just, just keeping on track with the railway line, can we just talk about the, the steel requirements? Just to show uh, it's only an hour, so uh, we'll, we'll go through the various things, but we probably won't cover it all. But I think the um, steel requirements for, before you even start getting uh, project buying, buying boomerang off the off the ground and working, is the steel requirements for the railway tracks is still a boost to the Australian economy because the, it's yeah, such a yeah, such the, a huge volume. There's only five steel mills in the world that can make the 68 kilogram to the metre Case Harden railway line for the standard gauge and. Um, uh, yeah, it is four foot eight and a half, uh, Colin. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit old in the head. Um, <laughs> I've been at, on, on Iron Boomerang 15 years. I might have been on too long, I think. So, But that 68 kilogram, we need rail and passing loops of about 200 K. And uh, that's the highest standard rail in the world. Only five steel companies, one of them's Wyala. And it uh, sort of dropped the production. And we visited there for two days. And we need 520,000 ton, half a million ton of that, of that, of that rail. Mm. It's, the standard, it's the standard Pilbara. It's called the Pilbara gauge, uh, the, the Pilbara rail gauge. It's known all over the world. And Nippon Steel has been buying our iron ore and coking coal and actually heralded the Queensland coking coal and, and WA iron ore developments. Mm. Japan being the leading steel country before China for 30 or 40 years before China and uh, developing Australia. Um, so that Nippon Steel makes that, that line and uh, Metal Steel in Spain, in Europe, EEC and one in the States. So you've actually got to get in a queue. It's a billion dollars worth of steel and it's a long run. Now, the, we visited for two days the Wyala Steelworks. It's the only long product steelworks in Australia, the only one. And it's been nearly bankrupt three times, or it has been mm. in the last 20 years. And uh, it's very vulnerable. And it still is today, uh, recent press. So nobody wants to lose that. It's a threat to our uh, defence. Um, and Bill, you know all about that. Um, and it's defence national security. And uh, not only uh, in defence, but also in commerce. And uh, in a war, you have to have a steel mill like that operating. The PIB order will be the biggest steel order in Australia's steel history long since federation or before and it'll be the most profitable long run now when we visited the steelworks in Wyala about four or five years ago they said the maximum we could supply of that order would be about 30 percent but the government could subsidize it at 70 percent of cost value which means there's no risk and they could start producing the order earlier than the order that we'd place, which um, three years ahead, they could produce 100% of that order. We'll also need a dual second rail five years after we build the first one as we expand. So that order is repeated. That would keep or save Wyala from bankruptcy and they could reorganize a long-term 50 to 100 year future. Um, and we have a plan and would be happy to work with them on that, be it the current owner or 
receivers or whatever. If I hope that doesn't happen, but we'll we'll be pleased to work with them, and it would secure Australia's future and the 22,000 people that live in Wyala. We're talking to the politicians in South Australia, but it's a great example of what Iron Boomerang can do for Australia. Well, just talking on South Australia, I mean, the political class have, have a vested interest in keeping South Australia afloat, um, basically through uh, defence, uh, the biggest uh, source of our uh, contracting uh, for defence. I mean, yep. there used to be shipyards in Victoria um, and they were basically shifted over to South Australia to boost its economy. And, and it's fairly well insulated from a lot of upset by these defence contracts in, in ships. And it's also got DSTO. It's got a number of other, other defence assets, uh, which was a, was a bit of a lifesaver when the car industry um, fell apart. We saw in, not the election before the last, uh, yeah, might have, no, the one before that, I think to save um, the government's seats over there, uh, we would construe that the contract for the submarine uh, was somewhat skewed to make sure South Australia um, Got a, was in a favourable position to get work, ongoing work for that project. Um, and that was a 50 billion, well, I reckon if it's $50 billion, it's got to be 70 plus, and we won't get anything for about 30 years. But in regards to South Australia, there is a, is a strong interest always by the federal government in regards to uh, keeping things viable there. So it certainly should appeal to the federal government to keep Wyala in place, keep the economy of South Australia well healed, um, because I don't think there's many places, I don't think it could possibly afford to lose that facility, A, for, a is for the nation, and B, as that community and for South Australia. So it's it's something I think they'd have a high interest in to, to keep that going and, and continue far into the future. Yeah, Bill, look, um, it's not just South Australia that benefits. Like, all the assets will be located in um, the northern area. And as you said, they all sit within the North Australia Infrastructure uh, Fund um, zoning. But in the same way as we'd be buying as much uh, railway line as we possibly could from Wyala, there's 7 million sleepers in this project. And, and you know, there's still reinforcement. 20% of that. Yeah, Seven concrete. Um, that could be Victorian. Steam. Yeah, that could be Victorian or New South Wales companies, or you know, one in each or two in each or something. So there's, and then there's all the steel fabrication for the uh, steel mills themselves. That steel's got to come from somewhere. A lot of that'll be modular constructed, but yeah. at least 20, 30 percent will be done in Australia. Yeah, mm. I was just concentrating on Wella basically because. Mm. It's all it's in a perilous position and mm. it's something we need as a nation to retain. Mm. So it's it's definitely something and it's something that can they can say basically start doing in a very soon to keep keep themselves viable. They don't have to wait years down the track. They like I oh, no. say, long, long as long as they can get the guarantee from the government. They can stockpile it and be used. used uh, well, it's, the a, it's a guarantee at no risk to the government. Seventy percent would mean they could manufacture it three years early ahead of ahead of delivery, and stockpile it, and and then we'll buy it at the full hundred percent. So there's there's no risk to the government, but they would need to finance it to that point. You know, to do a hundred percent supply, mm. and I think they should do that. That's my opinion. Um, but I should mention, and Colin will agree, I'm sure, when we send the slab bloom billet or coil, but we've costed it on slab, our slab sent to Wollongong, Port Kembla, Blue Scope Steel. Uh, currently, our steel is 10% dearer than the China benchmark world steel price. They produce 57% of the world steel. So when we supply the slab to, to Wollongong or what, Wyala, which we, Wyala should transition. It's running out of juice. 
you know, the, the mines there. And it and we can do that really well and protect the jobs and 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 change change gear, you know, like it's a bit like uh, Broken Hill, you know, it's expiring and that happens all over the world. And, but we need to do it sensibly rather than hang on like grim death. So, and we protect the jobs and even give them better jobs. So, mm -hmm. but we'll be 15% more competitive. We're 10% over. So Australia industry, there'll be 500,000 jobs within 10 years of first PIB steel because Australia will have a world competitive better than China, better than Korea or Japan. Mm. Um, competitive steel industry, that industries, automated industries, they'll be automated. Mm. And the Australian labour costs won't come into it too much. Mm. And so this is the reindustrialization. I've spoken to to many, many foundries in Australia, steel people and fabricators and constructors. And they know exactly, those people who are in that business uh, know exactly what Iron Boomerang can do. And this means that at the moment, we've gone from 9 million tonne of steel less than 15, 20 years ago to five. We produce nothing. We're importing more than we produce in mm. steel. And yeah. we'll be the most cost competitive steel place on earth. Mm. 44 million ton will repeat three times more mm. because it'll be so effective. And mm. who will benefit? Thailand, Vietnam, they don't want China. I'm not against China, but a monopoly is not good for any economy anywhere in the world. And it's certainly not good in monopoly 15, 57% uh, steel dominance in the world by China is not good for the world's economy. Thailand doesn't want China or anyone else, including Australia, dictating its steel terms in making a Toyota car for us, which they do right now. We don't make them anymore, but we can under the iron boomerang model and they can receive a slab from iron boomerang from their first stage steel mill, probably located at, at Newman and be 15 to 20% more competitive than China as well in their rolling mill second stage in Thailand. They're a big manufacturer of world cars. I just use them as an example, but there's Vietnam, there's Indonesia, there's Bangladesh. They're equal to China in population and in industrial future capacity. Bangladesh had 11% growth just before the pandemic. 11% growth as a developing country. We tend to write them off and not realize what's going on. Australia's future is in the Asian century, directly to our north. Sorry, I've got to cut back on that sermon. It's Colin <laughs> Stein. <laughs> if, we, if we can just move move along an hour or two. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest problems we have in regards to getting projects up and running uh, is the fit in regards to uh, carbon dioxide emissions and and that. So it's always always comes into play, you know, about you know industrialization, oh you got to produce more carbon dioxide and add to global warming and all these sort of things. But looking at your project, it actually is um, no, it cuts it. positive in regards to the reduction of emissions because it cuts down on so many other other factors that are uh, in the current supply chain. Yeah, it cuts it, cuts it, cuts it, it cuts it, it eliminates it eventually. It's mm. a transition, but it'll do it without subsidies and it'll do it in a transition format from 90% of the world's hydrogen is made from gas right now in the world. And we'll, we have a T3 LNG supply contract with the NT Power and Water. We have a 10 year renewable 20 petajoule, which is more than the total territory consumes. New South Wales is 70 petajoules totally for the whole state. So we've got a renew, we've got fuel security. Australia has 19 days. You must be aware of this bill, you know, of fuel storage, 21 Go days. On. We'd lose Go. a war, we'd lose a war in a week. Iron Boomerang 
has natural gas, which is cleaner than fracking gas. It can make LNG. It can make blue hydrogen from the LNG, capture and use the carbon for products, lower the cost of that process, and eventually go to green hydrogen when we capture the 100% of it. And we'll transport that to the industrial complexes, steel complexes, um, and process the carbon into viable products, which will help reduce costs on, mm. on steel per tonne, on everything, on the rail, the whole lot. So we've got our own fuel supply. Australia hasn't. We'd lose a war in a bloody week on fuel. Mm. Well, I mean, I mean how's that for a headline? The, the federal government's responsible to make sure that we've got 90 day supply. And I mean, mm. they just can't even do that basic. And that thing, and and that's a worry. And the other thing we've got a big problem is the uh, refineries. I think we just lost another one in West Australia. Mm. Uh, I think we might be down to four. four. Yeah, three, I think. Yeah, uh, so that's getting a pretty serious situation. I mean, we need we it's need. Not ace. pretty serious. <laughs> Catch the fire. It's, it's well, it's a I'm bigger just... threat than a war. Mm. But we'd lose a war in a week. The fuel consumption would go up five times if we're fighting a war and we got 19 day storage and, and then they wanted to store it in the, across the Pacific in the United States. Who dreamt that idea up? Well, so someone who doesn't want to spend any money on infrastructure and just wants to make sure that they can buy, buy votes by um, certain woke, woke principles and things like that, that seems to be federal government seems to have lost its focus in regards to what its charter was under the constitution and what it should be responsible for. And I think it's simple things like that 90 days storage of fuel that it's obligated to have it signed show, up to it. shows a real problem of their focus and they really need to get back to their responsibilities under the constitution hmm. and get out the way of the states well, them and look I, after I, their I, stuff. Iron Boomerang's got 10 years. Why can we do it? What, you know, what's wrong? You know, tell me. <laughs> oh, well, right. Government's got to support private enterprise. It can do it 10 times better than government. But it's got to support it, legislate it, fix up the red, green and black tape you were talking about and get the bloody job done. <laughs> That's, that's, what, that's right. I mean, Colin's an engineer. He wants a bloody job. He, he loves building <laughs> things. You know, that's what bloody engineers do. We're going to be the most automated operation, trains, ships, steel complex on earth. And still, and still generate half a million jobs in 10 years' time. How's that for a bloody technical automation, Bill? That's your background. That's right. We've, we've got some of the best engineers um, you know, ex Mox engineering from Perth, who lives at the Gold Coast, running Queensland Health assets, three and a half billion. Mm. He, he was wiring up the automation of China's steel mills. Mm. I couldn't believe it. He's a mate of mine. He's going to come on board and give us a hand. I hope he doesn't mind saying that. <laughs> you know, um, he, and I hope the Premier of Queensland's not listening in. <laughs> just <laughs> he might lose it's his just <laughs> Just on the transport side of it, in regards to, you know, let's face it, the, all the oil carriers and the coal carriers run it, run it, run on diesel, pump out plenty of carbon dioxide. So, what's the sort of savings we can expect in regards can to? Can I answer to that, Bill? Yes. Now, um, um, Shane's a bit modest. He, um, you can see he's passionate. Modest. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> But you can see his passion, and, and I've got to say that I've only been working with him for about six, seven, eight months now. But the amount of work yeah, this guy's a... put into this um, into this project, and the thinking that's gone into it, and the outcomes are just absolutely amazing to have come from predominantly one person. So I oh, know it's a team, than, but yeah, well, it is a team. But the innovation and that is um, is definitely. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of innovation in the project. So let's talk about these trains. Now, a conventional train on a GE general electric system has a diesel engine driving a generator that then drives electric um, 
uh, motors in the wheels. Now, um, so the proposal for Project Iron Boomerang is have a gas turbine instead for a few reasons. One is a gas turbine for the same amount of power produces half the amount of carbon dioxide in emissions compared to a diesel engine. Yep. The other thing is that um, the, uh, the gas supply we've got in the centre of Australia, which probably isn't economic um, at the moment because the cost to build um, uh, infrastructure to get it somewhere, will be our major refuelling centre. So our trains fill up in the middle, they go east and back, fill up again, then go west and back. So we're utilising fuel reserves. And, and as Shane said, we've got, you know, there's, there's more than 10 years in the ground. It's just the, that's the sort of size contract we're talking about. There's probably 50 years or 100 years of gas in the ground. So Project Iron Boomerang is not going to suck um, energy out of any other um, uh, projects in Australia. We, we come with our own energy sources. We've got um, uh, engines uh, that will produce half the greenhouse gas emissions. The um, uh, other benefit is if you go to a hybrid drive and you've got, even with a one in 300 grade um, uh, rail, when you go on downhill, a 44,000 ton payload, uh, or sorry, 44,000 ton gross load train needs a little bit of braking and that'll go into um, um, regeneratively braking, powering up batteries and then, the uh, batteries will be used to take it up the one in 300 grade that comes after you get to the bottom of the hill. So that, that sort of reduces the fuel consumption by 20%. So we've got the, the greenhouse gas emissions are halved by using a turbine and then using a hybrid drive. They drop to 40% of what- uh, Like the a Toyota is. Paris car. Yeah, it's exactly it's like a principle. hybrid car. Exactly. And, and there's, there's this level of thinking, because Shane's been working on this project for 15 years, and, and you'd get the impression from what he said, oh, we went to Wyala for you know, a couple of days, but he's been to you know, Japan, America, and all these sorts of places. He's talked to people, he's aired his ideas, he's got feedback on those ideas, he's incorporated the good comments from that feedback into the project, which is why over 15 years, he's built it into being such an incredibly good project. It really is a project for its time. It's, um, there's nothing in Australia that could tick as many boxes for the good of Australia as what Project Iron Boomerang does. And Project Iron Boomerang doesn't tick these boxes just once. Most of the boxes it ticks several times. Well, it, it, if I can just break in, Colin, the... the the LNG will be using the coke oven gas, which is a, and will clean it up and capture the carbon and use it. And it, there'll be no government subsidies, uh, you know. Um, we might do some experiments and they'll help with that if maybe, but we don't need it. And it'll be more efficient, more cost effective, but we'll make LNG out of the gas for our ships. So mm. our ships and trains are, are, are diesel electric, you know, 10 years, ago and our ships will be propeller driven pod 360 degree variable pitch bow thrusters 55 ships 100,000 tonners this will be the rebirth of Australia's shipping fleet you know if Australia owns 20 percent of iron boomerang that 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 that's uh, 22 ships that's more than you know the ANL fleet that I shipped my export prawns on mm. in the 19, 1980s you know, so, I mean, it's gone pretty well, it doesn't exist anymore. And mm. it'll be an automated ship. And so will the trains and there'll, there'll still be humans, but I mean, uh, mm. uh, so the labor cost isn't an issue. It means we can compete and actually outcompete the rest of the world. And yeah. we're a continent, the tyranny of distance continent. Those ships will bring containers down at a 40% discounted rate which makes the whole country, the whole continent more competitive with its trading nations yeah. to and from, not in and out, both. Yeah. And sometimes the freight component is 40% of a total cost of a product of an LCD screen or something. Yeah. You know, so um, we depend, we manufacture nothing. 17% yeah. of our containers, dry containers, 2.3 million of them go back empty. 
as a go back full. Yeah. That's eighty three percent empty, mm. which shows that we're manufacturing nothing. We're the worst manufacturing country. We must be at the very bottom mm. of the OECD. Thirty six countries, mm. developed yeah. countries. It's, no, Bill, it's a disgrace. Australia mm. should hang its head in shame. And no, we've Bill, got to do this. We've got to overcome. We we need commitment to vision. We need commitment to leadership. We need beyond the electoral cycle. Bill, you might China's ask. doing and beating us on. And I'm not Bill, against Chinese. I like You'll them. get a word in, Colin. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get a word in. Yeah, you, you mute Shane for a minute. You might ask, <laughs> you might ask why these ships can do everything Shane just claimed. And the reason is after he'd looked at the advantages of backhauling with the rail, he then said, why can't we do it with shipping? Because what happens at the moment is all these huge cape sized ships, they go full of iron ore to China, they come back empty. They go full of coking coal to Japan and South Korea and they come back empty. So the ship that Shane designed, and he's got a patent on it, it's his own ship, this is all his own thinking. The ship he's designed takes the slabs, the produced steel, so, you know, it's not 60% um, iron, it's 100% it's or well, nearly 100% iron. And it goes to the consuming uh, areas in the world where the rolling mills are and the steels are uh, subsequently manufactured into saleable products. But the ship is designed so that it can backhaul containers. Now, you can't put containers into a bulk cargo ship. But if you've got a ship that's designed specifically to carry slab, billet or um, coil steel in one direction and bring containers back in the other, you've suddenly solved the problem of shipping cost into Australia. And it's even better than that. You look at the photo behind Shane and the steel goes in the area below deck and it can still carry a couple of thousand containers on top. So we can actually export uh, containerized produce and it could be from our increased agricultural stuff because Project 9 Boomerang is going to be the biggest shot in the arm for agriculture in Australia. With the extra fertiliser at low cost that we might be able to produce, there could be a 50% increase in agricultural production. Now, uh, in export terms, that takes us from currently around $66 billion a year in exports to nearly 100. And, and, and that could be driven on the back of the, uh, the lower cost uh, high performing fertilizers that we'll be able to produce out of what are essentially byproducts in the steel making process, plus accessing the sulfur potash um, uh, mines that uh, Shane uh, talked about. But we can make ammonium nitrate out of our waste products. So um, that can supplement the sulfur potash. So the, the situation is that. No, it's a combination. Uh, it, it, it's we're, a complementary. The sulfate of potash is complementary with the urea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it actually, they need both. Yeah. And the urea... Like a full component then. Yeah. And the urea is a great way to um, re-establish carbon in the soil. We've been talking to one of Australia's most knowledgeable uh, farming people. And uh, he said his farm, he's tested the soil and it's about 1% in the active um, farming areas. It, he believes it was probably 2% carbon um, prior to farming started and the tests that they've done show the optimum plant yield comes from 3%. So if we can get carbon back into the soils and the best way to do that is with urea and you make urea by mixing carbon monoxide with um, ammonium nitrate. Now we can make carbon monoxide very cheaply because we're going to have the biggest oxygen plant in the world, one, two of them, one at each end of the line serving the steel parks. And carbon dioxide, if you add oxygen to it, you make carbon monoxide. So we take the carbon dioxide from the steel making process, add oxygen to it because our oxygen plant, Air Liquid's boss told Shane, you will get a plant of this size for half the capital per unit of oxygen required and half the operating costs. So we'll be able to produce oxygen cheaper than anyone else in the world. We'll be able to then um, mix it with the carbon dioxide to turn it into carbon monoxide, add it to the ammonia that we can produce from 
also byproducts because we get hydrogen out of the ovens and we get uh, nitrogen out of the oxygen plant. It's another byproduct. So we make um, uh, ammonium nitrate, add carbon monoxide. You've got urea and that's the key to um, uh, recarbonizing our soils to increase their productivity. So the, the tentacles from Project Iron Boomerang reach into almost every industry within Australia. Everyone will benefit in so many ways, including the greens, the green ideals, because the way we make these fertilizers is by uh, capturing and reusing the carbon dioxide instead of um, um, you know, not producing it in the first place. We're using the most efficient uh, technology for making steel so we'll produce a little bit less carbon dioxide to start with but then what we produce we've identified a whole heap of different steps for subsequent um, uh, means of usage where uh, as the price goes up a little bit we can capture more and more carbon dioxide and we produce more and more benefits so there's the potential that we could be producing green steel that's sold with carbon credits that's how good this project is well, just touching on that, uh, I was speaking, as I, as I said before the show, with the pe people at Merchants and uh, Hydrogen uh, Renewable Project. Uh, I think it's Greg Kalis, and I was speaking with uh, Peter Soddengard. Um, they're, they're really sort of just not in any, haven't done anywhere near the development of that's gone into your project mm. and they will come on the show after the, after another month or so when they've got some more concrete ideas and uh, graphics and presentations. Mm. But the thing that gets me in regards to the governments, both state and federal, seem to go out of their way to tick the boxes of any project that's renewable mm. or seem to be green. Yep. And uh, it's... <laughs> and it's definitely the flavour of the next next decade, I suppose. Yep. Now, the other thing that sort of concerned me is hydrogen is, is hydrogen. There's a lot of talk about it, but it really isn't the market there at the moment. There's not no. the infrastructure, and it's still a long way off. I mean, they're still arguing around. I think we've got a hydrogen project by Origin Energy going and for around Townsville, and we've got the one in West Australia. Uh, Council one is compressed um, hydrogen, uh, ship raw. Uh, the one in the Murchis, um, by Murchison up in uh, Western, Northern West Australia is conversion to ammonia and then shipped as ammonia. Mm. Uh, so that's the sort of thing they're still debating sort of that's going on. But mm. the thing that concerns me is the Murchison, they're only at this sort of stage, you know, and they've already basically got the tick in the box as being as from the federal government as a, as a as a major project, you know, yeah. a priority project. The biggest belief, right, that they can give that status, which is a very important status from my understanding in regards to the way things get progressed. Now. Is there a possibility that the government might come on board and at least give Ein Boomerang that, that status in the near term? Yeah, look, we're preparing um, um, paperwork now for, for government because in fairness to government, um, we've, um, we've got to get a consolidated application in for support and we, we don't so much need it for the funding because the... Um, the sovereign funds from the steel producing countries around the world want to get involved, but they want to see that the Australian government and, and the state governments have got some skin in the game. Uh, nice but there's, yeah. yeah, there's got to be there's got to be some upfront funding, which will basically be to get the approvals in place, and um, uh, that'll need to um, uh, include a whole, whole uh, of government approach. Yeah, it's got to be a whole yeah, of government. That's really important. Work. Four governments are involved. Yeah. Yeah. WANT, Queensland and the Federal. Yeah. And so we're preparing the paperwork for, for bringing all the aspects of um, Project Iron Boomerang to all of those government levels. <coughs> we'll be doing it through NAIF um, because um, 
uh, all the assets will be located within the uh, the NAIF jurisdiction. NAIF's got the funding. We're only looking for 0.3% of the total cost of the project as an upfront contribution from the government um, because it'll get the approvals going. Um, it'll it, it, the, it'd be a repayable uh, bond, 10 years. And, and yeah, we're not looking for a grant. We're looking for 10-year um, uh, repayable bonds. And... Um, once uh, the governments demonstrate that commitment to the project, uh, these other sovereign funds will uh, jump in and um, it's a 70, well, 70 billion dollar fund and they'll be, um, uh, they'll be providing that funding direct. I mean, what, you, you look at a country like um, uh, Indonesia, for instance, consumes you know, a little bit over 60 kilograms of steel uh, per person per annum, but um, Thailand and Vietnam, a little bit more advanced, um, uh, consume um, uh, more than three times that amount. And so just to bring, and India is the same, it's only a little bit over 60 kilograms uh, per person per year. So India and Indonesia themselves would be um, interested in taking all the steel, not that we're going to do that, we're going to limit each country to just 20% of, um, of the steel mills involved. But India and Indonesia would be interested in taking it all because they want to um, um, uh, triple or quadruple the amount of steel they produce so they can provide their populations with the same level of services that Thailand and Vietnam get, let alone South Korea and Japan. So um, there's, um, there's a lot of interest from the countries that produce steel to get involved because they'll be able to produce it cheaper in Australia. And then with the boomerang class ship, they, and, they and green, and, uh, we'll, we'll advance their green status because as yes. developing countries, they don't have to comply. Hmm. Well, just, just, just in the comparison so, about so the we'll, major- We'll actually make it better. We'll actually accelerate their compliance. Yes. Which well, is I'll, a hell of a which is a hell of a thing for the world. Nobody wants pollution. You don't have to be green. Who wants pollution? You know, and Iron Boomerang pr practically, logically does that through the supply chain and the steel complex scale yeah. Yeah. and ability to. So not only does it, that's separate to capture and use and 100% green yeah. with even with a credit. So I mean, we're I... viable products. So it, it's it's way ahead of the rest of the world, and the green hydrogen steel. No, there's not. They're spending billions on it in EEC virtue signalling. They call it. I don't even know what that means, but um, they're spending billions on hydrogen green steel, and nobody knows the cost per ton. It'd be like saying I need oxygen, and I don't know where I'm going to get it from. Mm. That's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. It really is bad. And it's got me very concerned yeah. about my grandkids and their future. Mm. When, when you've got major fully developed countries are backing on green steel, they're going to double or treble the cost of steel. That means that developing countries like Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, there's a skyrocket economy. They're going to stop developing because steel will be double or treble the cost. Mm. It's bullshit, and we can't put up with it. Mm. The point I was trying to get across in regards to major project status is that if something like a West Australian project like the hydrogen one gets a tick in the box, if I was a North Queensland senator, I'm afraid I'd be sitting at your door telling you, where's my bloody application for major project status? I'd be on your back, say, get this in so we can give it to you because the nation needs it. And hey, listen, Shane got uh, state project status um, um, uh, several years ago it. from Queensland. Yeah, we did. We did have it. We had a team of three appointed and, and they talked to WA. They flew over to WA, the Queensland team, and uh, they, they facilitated the... The, the coordination of the project, which is what they do with major project status. Mm. And uh, that was the only time we ever got it. If you get a Labor or, 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 or Liberal government elected in WA, Queensland, NT or federal government, uh, the four governments we got to deal with, one that will love us 
and the next one I'll hate us because it's political. <laughs> Bloody anyway, Jeff, we can't anyway. run a country like that. <laughs> no, China's well, that's, not. That's, that's got a long-term Belt and Road plan. <laughs> Australia's <laughs> Belt and Road plan is Project Iron Boomerang. It's Belt and Road on steroids. It's better <laughs> purpose design, purpose design into fully integrated assets. Ships, trains, steel complexes, ports. China hasn't done it to the detail we've done it. Mm. And they know it. They said, you'll be the only one. The steel mill boardrooms in China said to me, and in Korea and in Japan, you'll be the only one who can compete with China. Australia, the lucky country, with its coking coal and resources and iron, iron ore, well, we just, just need what governments are we doing with the, sitting here the talking book. like what are we doing sitting here talking like old chooks in a chook yard? <laughs> well, we, 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 we want our now. politicians, we uh, want our politicians to take up the challenge and just get on with it. Yeah, well, um, general, well in fairness like, look, look, to the politicians, hopefully next week we'll get some paperwork to them. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll, start. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll be we'll looking forward to that. that stuff. It's my fault. Gentlemen, it's gone well past the hour. Yeah, uh, we'll wind it up there, but in a few months' time, I'd like to come back and maybe we'll move on to the steel complexes and and the advantages of well, those. Yeah. Um, and we can also look at uh, the difference of uh, a nation shipping a slab of steel instead of just put out of the ground. Mm. Yeah, and oh, and yeah, economic well. benefit to us long term and the reindustrialization, what it, what it means for the reindustrialization of the nation. More than doubles the value of our number one and number three, four a a a assets. Mm. Doubles the value, so the government's tax it. Mm. So they're going to make 30 billion more extra growth, taxable revenue per annum. Mm. Well, they that's desperately need it because they're in more than 5%. <laughs> well, that's okay, a gentlemen. The steel prices are up 40, 50% mm. globally. Mm. Okay, uh, gentlemen, we'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for your, for your participation tonight. It was great to have you on. Um, I'll just, if you just stay on for a minute, I'll just wind up the show and come back to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You've been watching Regional Wrap. Join us again next week uh, for our sixth episode. My name is Bill Bates. If you like the show, Join us, follow us, and like us on Facebook, and also on YouTube, you can subscribe and like. Thank you very much, and we'll see you again next week. Good night. <laughs>